Well, good evening and welcome. My name is Beck Taylor. It's my privilege to serve as Whitworth University's 18th president and host for this evening's program. I want to welcome all of you to the third and final evening of the 2017-18 President's Colloquy on Civil Discourse. This year's colloquy series is meant to convene the Whitworth community on issues that inform both the challenges and the opportunities associated with constructive, healthy, productive, and civil discourse on issues that divide us, and to do so from a distinctly Christian and multidisciplinary perspective. I'm so grateful to all of the speakers who have formed our conversations this year, and to you, the Whitworth community, for your commitments to enter into this important space. I also want to once again mention my sincere thanks to Professor Nate King, who is here tonight, who has been my partner in this project. Thank you, Nate, for your contributions to this effort. So tonight's prompting question is this, how free should free speech be? Perhaps during no time since the 1960s have the battle lines drawn around the issue of free speech been so hotly debated. It's a rare week in higher education when a college campus isn't in the news for protests for or against allowing some controversial speaker to address its students. Many of us have watched in disbelief as normally idyllic college campuses have gone up in flames. Administrative buildings have been ransacked. Speakers and their supporters clobbered and bloodied, and protesters gassed. Often at the center of these scenes are university presidents surveying uh, all of this uh, activity and wondering certainly what's going on. Other uh, folks have been faculties and boards, students and members of the media trying to find some footing to understand the complex and dynamic forces at work. At odds, it seems, are two fundamental commitments that at first blush seem unimpeachable. These commitments form the basis not only for higher education, I would argue, but also for American democracy itself. The first is the pledge that most colleges and universities elevate to create and sustain a culture that promotes safety, inclusion, and hospitality to diverse groups of people. The second foundational commitment is to protecting freedom of expression and liberty of conscience in the pursuit of truth. Taken individually, it's hard to disagree with either one of these values. But many of the controversies appearing on our campuses today seem to pit these two values against one another. Earlier this year, the American Council on Education released a survey of nearly 500 college and university presidents on this issue. My responses are included in the results. Overwhelmingly, presidents, including me, supported the values of creating inclusive spaces, in fact, 98% saying that this was either very or extremely important, and these presidents voiced support for protecting citizens' free speech rights. Also, 98% of presidents surveyed indicated that this was very or extremely important. But when asked to judge which value was more important, an overwhelming 96% of college presidents, including myself, said that it is more important that students are exposed to all types of speech, even when they might find that speech offensive or biased, than to protect students by prohibiting offensive or biased speech. For example, 85% of those presidents surveyed indicated that it was never acceptable to shout down a speaker. No president in the survey endorsed violence as a means to protest a particular speaker, no matter how controversial the ideas that speaker supports. But interestingly, and I think reflecting the challenges many universities face when navigating these events, current students report different views on what is and what is not acceptable speech and behavior on their campuses. The Gallup organization, for example, recently conducted a similar survey of current college students on First Amendment issues. 
In that survey, like college presidents, students also indicated strong support for both campus inclusion and freedom of expression. But when asked to choose which is more important, although the majority of students also preference free speech over protection, that majority is much smaller. Additionally, students cite many more exceptions to the free speech mandate and appear to endorse certain forms of censorship, including the shouting down of speakers or denying access to news media, more often do their college and campus presidents. These differences highlight just some of the challenges we face as academic communities, and they form just one of the backdrops for tonight's conversation. Before I introduce our evening speaker, I want to mention that this session is being videotaped and will be made available on Whitworth's website in the coming days. You may access the first two evenings conversations already online, and I would encourage you to do so, linked from the President's Office webpage under the President's Colloquy link there. Also, after our speakers have delivered their remarks this evening, we will open up our conversation to questions from you. Each of you should have found a pencil and a note card on your seats. And during the presentation, I would encourage you to jot down any questions you have for any of our speakers. At the end, Ruth Pels and Nate King will collect those during the course of the evening and choose a few for us to consider as we conclude tonight. So now to our speakers. Delivering the plenary address tonight is Dr. Erica Salkin, Associate Professor of Communication Studies. She joined the Whitworth faculty in 2012 after completing her doctorate in mass communication with a minor in education leadership and policy analysis at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Dr. Salkin's research efforts focus on speech rights in academic settings, as well as student press. She is the author of the book entitled Students' Right to Speak and is a co-author with Whitworth alumna Logan Schinkel of the book titled Student Speech Policy Readability in Public Schools. Erica's third book on this topic is entitled Private Schools, Student Media, and it is under contract with Lexington Books for a 2020 publication date. Her classes here at Whitworth cover freedom of speech and press, public relations, and digital journalism. Discussing Dr. Salkin's remarks tonight are three other fabulous members of Whitworth's faculty. Sitting next to Erica is, is Professor Kathy Lee. She is chair of Whitworth's political science department. Dr. Lee first taught at Whitworth from 1984 to 1990 and then returned, we're very grateful, in 2011. She holds the PhD in political science from Johns Hopkins University and a Juris Doctor degree from Temple University. Dr. Lee's research ranges from immigration law to gender issues to women's legal history. Her most recent publication, an article about the Council for Christian Colleges and Universities, titled, quote, The CCCU Tries to Thread the Needle, end quote, appeared in the periodical sightings published by the Martin Marty Center for the Public Understanding of Religion at the University of Chicago. Sitting next to Kathy is Professor of Communication Studies, Dr. Mike Ingram. He directs Whitworth's speech and debate team and co-directs the Ethics Bowl team here at Whitworth. Both teams, I should say, are nationally ranked and are recent national champions. Dr. Ingram earned the PhD in Rhetoric and Public Address from Ohio University and joined Whitworth's faculty in 1988. Previously, Mike served as a department chair and associate provost for faculty development here at Whitworth. He has presented on communication ethics to the National Communication Association, and his scholarship has appeared in academic journals such as Ethica, and the Journal of the International Public Debate Association. And last, but certainly not least, is Dr. Will Kynes, Associate Professor of Theology and the Assistant Director of the George F. Whitworth Honors Program. Before coming to Whitworth in 2013, Dr. Kynes spent six years in the UK where he completed the MLIT at the University of St. Andrews and the PhD at the University of Cambridge, and then taught for a while at the University of Oxford. His research focuses on wisdom and suffering in the Hebrew Bible. Dr. Kine's first book, titled My Psalm Has Turned Into Weeping, Job's Dialogue with the Psalms, earned international recognition in 2015 
when it was awarded the Manfred Lautenschläger Award for Theological Promise. His second book, titled An Obituary for Wisdom Literature, will be published by Oxford University Press later this year. And this fall, Will will lead the Honors Program's first Smithsonian internship semester in Washington, D.C., before spending his sabbatical this spring at his alma mater, the University of Virginia. I know you will agree that this is an outstanding panel of speakers. Please join me in thanking each of them. So it's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Salkin to deliver your remarks. Thank you. Thank you, President Taylor, and thank you to Professor Nate King for creating the space for these valuable discussions. I'd also like to thank my fellow panelists for sharing their time and their wisdom with us this evening on a topic that is so very near and dear to my heart. How free should free speech be? To begin, we'll go back in time to 1965 to Des Moines, Iowa, where 13-year-old Mary Beth Tinker and her older brother John wore black armbands to their public high school to protest the Vietnam War. The Des Moines School Board, having been warned about the Tinker's plan to protest, passed a district-wide policy specifically forbidding the wearing of armbands. Mary Beth, John, and three other students were suspended for refusing to remove the armbands. Now, protest was not new for the Tinker family. Mary Beth and John's father was a Methodist minister who had been fired by one of his congregations for speaking out against segregation at a public pool. The family would later join a Quaker church because of its commitment to social justice. An adult Mary Beth, when interviewed by a group of students about her actions as a child, said the integration of faith and justice that her parents modeled led her to wear the armbands. In her words, I had examples of people who stood up for what they believe in, like my parents, like Martin Luther King Jr., and the kids who took part in the Birmingham Children's Crusade against segregation in 1963. We saw those kids on TV. Even though they were arrested and attacked with dogs and fire hoses, they kept marching. So I got the idea that sometimes you might get in trouble for peaceful protests, but sometimes you should still do them. Instead of removing their armbands and going back to school, the Tinkers went to court. Four years of the judicial system led them to the Supreme Court of the United States and the opportunity to make their plea. Could a public school overseen by an elected body and therefore an extension of government blatantly restrict student speech? The First Amendment reads, Congress, later interpreted to mean all government, shall make no law abridging freedom of speech or of the press. Is this not abridgment? The standard approach up until that point in history to answering that question was no. Children, minors, had nothing to add to the national discourse that the First Amendment was created to support. They had nothing to say, and therefore nothing to protect. The Supreme Court thought differently. Writing for the majority, Associate Justice Abe Fortas declared, it can hardly be argued that either students or teachers shed their constitutional rights to freedom of speech or expression at the schoolhouse gate. Schools could not censor student speech absent evidence of a material or substantial disruption to the orderly school environment. What's more? That evidence had to be real. As Fortas wrote, undifferentiated fear or apprehension of disturbance is not enough to overcome the right to freedom of expression. Any departure to absolute regimentation may cause trouble. Any variation from the majority's opinion may cause fear. But our Constitution says we must take this risk. That our history says this sort of hazardous freedom, this kind of openness, that is the basis of our national strength and of the independence and vigor of Americans who grow up and live in this relatively permissive, often disputatious society. It was a radical idea in the late 60s that young people might have something to say. But here we are nearly 50 years later, and the students at Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, and indeed at high schools and colleges all across the country, are reminding us again that youth does not equal ignorance. As students take to modern platforms of communication to share their passionately held beliefs, we see that young people have something to say, and that speech has the power to create great change. 
But here lies our problem with free expression. When we think of this right, this fundamental freedom, our imagination often goes to our nation's greatest orators, sharing messages of justice and hope and change, often against the backdrop of a national monument or two. You're hearing them in your imagination right now, aren't you? Martin Luther King Jr. and I have a dream. Susan B. Anthony, are women persons? Alev Wiesel, looking to a new millennium with profound fear and extraordinary hope. And when we hear these powerful words, we're grateful to the right of free speech that ensures that no government actor can prevent speakers from speaking and audiences from hearing. But freedom of speech is not defined by its center. It's defined by its edges. It's on the outskirts of expression where we determine what enjoys the protection of the Constitution and what can be freely regulated by government. And the speech on the edges is far less noble. In fact, it's often unkind, offensive, and painful. It's the speech of Westboro Baptist Church. It's the speech of a KKK le leader looking for revenge. It's the speech of a man named Paul Cohen in a leather jacket with a not quite suitable for work message about the draft. If you're curious, look it up. It's there where we answer how free should free speech be, and it is the Wild West of modern expression. And there's a lot in that Wild West that we do not like. Modern communication platforms allow a greater range of messages than we have ever had in human history. We can speak one to one, one to many, many to many. We can share messages with uncommon speed, which can override the deliberation that previous technologies required. We can share messages with uncommon strength, as a tweet or a snap or a post can travel the world in mere minutes. And we can share messages with uncommon gall as speakers pour anger and rage into the public square without having to see the pain in a recipient's eyes or even attach a name to their trollery. My grandmother would have called this chutzpah, and I find it to be a very good word indeed. As we live within this whirlwind of messages and messaging and a prevailing narrative that civility is dead and partisanship has overridden good sense and that the world has lost what our colleague Josh Lyme advocated for in the first talk in this series, humility and self-awareness, it may seem like free speech is simply too strong a power for us mere mortals. It's a right that cannot withstand the follies of our imperfect selves, and perhaps it needs to go. To that, I say, no. The solution, dear friends, is to educate, not regulate. That sounds good. Let's say that together. Ready? Educate, not regulate. Oh, we could do better than that. Educate, not regulate. There you go. Teaching what it means to be a citizen in the United States is not a new concept. According to the Education Commission on the states, 47 states plus the District of Columbia address civic education through state statute. Every state requires students to complete coursework in civics or social studies in order to graduate, and every state includes civic learning or social studies in its standards or curriculum. We have long known that in our quest to prepare young people for their roles as citizens, we need to educate them on what citizenship means, both its rights and its responsibilities. Free speech, too, conveys rights and responsibilities, and the time has come to remind ourselves as a community and as a nation what it means to live within a free speech society. We know the idea behind a constitutional right to free speech was heavily influenced by thinkers like John Milton, who wrote, let truth and falsehood grapple. Whoever knew truth put to the worse in a free and open encounter. Here we see a reference to what many call the marketplace of ideas, a concept loosely based on the Greek agora, an open-air market where all could go to talk about issues of the day. All, of course, as long as you were white and male and a landowner and a citizen, but, you know, that's an issue for another day. This was the idealized space for truth and falsehood to clash. And when that happens, truth, Milton says, will win. Our Supreme Court has used this idea. Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, writing for the dissent in Abrams versus United States, argued that a group of Russian immigrants should not be punished for distributing anti-war literature in 1918. Instead, their ideas should have the opportunity to be reviewed and accepted or rejected by the people. 
in his words, when men have realized that time has upset many fighting faiths, they may come to believe even more than they come to understand the foundations of their own conduct that the ultimate good desired is far better reached in a free trade of ideas. That the best test of truth is the power of the thought to get itself accepted in the competition of the market. And that truth is the only ground upon which their wishes safely can be carried out. That, at any rate, is the theory of our Constitution. It is an experiment, as all life is an experiment. Note the language the court uses when it speaks of free speech. This hazardous freedom. Life as an experiment. Free speech is a risk, but one that carries reward. Much of our existing free speech jurisprudence is built around this idea of maintaining a free and uninhibited trade of ideas. That when there is time for good speech to meet bad, for more ideas to address fewer, for diverse voices to consider the strength or worth of an idea that it is better for government to get out of the way and allow that process to happen rather than interfere with the competition of the market. And that is a profound statement of trust in our fellow citizens, that when presented with a range of ideas, we will naturally be drawn to the good ones, to truth. Maybe we're reluctant to extend that trust, that grace to our fellow humans. After all, we live in a world where fake news and alternative facts are now common parts of our vernacular. A recent study out of MIT showed that a false story reaches 1,500 people six times faster than a true one. And while false stories outperform truth on every subject, including business and terrorism, war, science, technology, and entertainment, fake news about politics does the best. Fake news prospers, the authors wrote, because humans, not robots, are more likely to spread it. But even falsity has a place in the market. In Times versus Sullivan, a landmark Supreme Court case that extended First Amendment protection to false statements of fact, the court wrote, quote, erroneous statement is inevitable in free debate, but it must be protected if freedoms of expression are to have the breathing space they need to survive. Imagine if every statement you made had to be absolutely and completely true including any information you might not even know. Otherwise, you would face terrible consequences. Students in this room, imagine if every time you raised your hand, you better be right or you're failing the whole class. How many of you are going to raise your hands? How many of us are going to raise new ideas, disagree, speak at all? Instead of shutting speech down, even false speech, it is better for all ideas to be shared and for people to find their way to wisdom, which brings us back to the solution, which I say again is education, not regulation. Teaching what it means to engage in the right and responsibility of free speech in today's modern society, both the written and unwritten rules, does not occur solely in the classroom. We teach and learn every day through example. We can model responsibility of speech by asking critical questions of the ideas put before us, begging to be spoken. Are you true? Are you reasonable? Or are you an unfounded opinion wrapped in a thin shroud of fact? We can pause and take a breath. And in that moment of contemplation, however long or short it might be, we can find the space to hear how we are called to use our gift of speech to the benefit of ourselves and others. Our colleague, Nate King, reminded us in February that treating others well in our intellectual endeavors is part of hearing Christ's call to love. Model that love. Take that breath. We can model the right and responsibility by using our words to teach and share and inspire, but not to smother. Some would say that shouting down speakers with whom you do not agree or loudly protesting to drown out controversial views is simply meeting bad speech with good. When that happens, though, there is no opportunity for the market to deliberate over ideas, as one side has made a unilateral decision to deny the other the opportunity to be heard. University campuses like ours all across the country are facing this issue, sometimes called the heckler's veto. This use of speech transforms what could be an elegant and powerful force into an undiscerning, irrational club. And it's out of place with an environment that is dedicated to the exploration of knowledge. The Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals called universities great bazaars of ideas. It's a great word, right? Bazaars of ideas. 
And while those bazaars may be, in the court's words, rude, cacophonous, and even distasteful at times, it is essential that they be places where ideas may flourish, where questions may be asked, and where answers may be pursued. We can teach and learn about the rights and responsibilities of speech by recognizing that the marketplace has not always been open to all voices. People who have been in the market from its beginning have time and tradition on their side to amplify their volume. If you aren't white or male, straight, middle or upper class, in favor of the popular narrative, your voice doesn't carry in the marketplace as vigorously as those who have some or all of those traits. It's easy to reject an idea if you can't hear it. We need to retrain our ears to hear the voices of different experiences. And yes, we need to acknowledge that decades and centuries of unequal status in US society have robbed millions of people of the ability to fully engage in free speech. This leads me to perhaps the biggest thing we can do to address the challenge of free speech in modern society, retrain ourselves to listen as much as or more than we speak. It may sound obvious, but half of speaking is listening. The right to free speech has always included the right of an audience to hear as well. Theorist Alexander Mickeljohn believed free speech did not mean that all speakers will speak, but that all good ideas will be said. Indeed, many First Amendment challenges have come not from speakers, but from audiences who demand the right to engage with a wide range of ideas free of government restriction. But retraining our ears is difficult, especially when the ideas being shared run contrary to our own. In this listening, we start to see the idea of tolerance emerge. Now, I'm not saying we need to tolerate individually all ideas. The, the solution is not to automatically abandon our own deeply held beliefs. But tolerance of the fact that a diverse range of beliefs, values, and ways of life exist in our communities and our world. Perhaps First Amendment scholar Stephen Smith put it best. Tolerance, he wrote, is permitting others to hold and disseminate erroneous beliefs. Our instinct, he notes, is to call these ideas out as wrong and demand that those who believe bad ideas change their minds. And if they don't, we need to force them to do so. Thus, we get proposed laws that say some ideas should never, ever be spoken because they are wrong. And others should be spoken by everyone because they are good. In legal terms, by the way, we call that compelled speech and censorship, and they aren't, aren't good, that is. There is danger in that line of thinking. The idea that those who do not believe what you do are wrong and therefore must be forced into compliance, it's a short journey from dismissing the validity of a person's ideas to dismissing, dismissing the validity of that person. It results in contempt, which really kills any opportunity for a productive exchange of ideas. I'm reminded of the story of Christ's call to Philip and Nathaniel in the book of John. Philip went to Nathaniel excited about the news of the Messiah. In chapter 1, verse 45, he says, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. To which Nathaniel replies, Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Philip says, Come and see. Now, I realize there are many ways that one could interpret this passage, but to me, I hear contempt in Nathaniel's voice. How easy it is for him to dismiss Christ because of his birthplace. It takes a demonstration of Christ's divinity. I saw you beneath the fig tree. For him to open his mind to the idea he might be wrong and that Jesus had a message worth hearing. Now, that is not a solution available to all of us. We need to learn how to better receive and contemplate messages. It's a difficult task, as it was for Nathaniel, because it means opening our minds up to the unfamiliar. Today's communication platforms have made it easier than ever to enclose ourselves in a perfect bubble of agreement, filtering away ideas and speakers who might disrupt our idea of what is good and what is right. Don't like what a person has to say? Mute! Block! Unfriend! And those pesky ideas will go away. And maybe, just maybe, you'll add a little saucy remark on your way out just to show that person who was so clearly wrong. Because nothing good can come from Nazareth, can it? We can all learn how to be better audiences. And in do so, we can keep the many, many benefits of free speech. The solution is not to restrict a powerful freedom, but to use it better. How free should free speech be? 
free enough to both speak and listen, to share and receive, and to allow all voices equal purchase in the marketplace of ideas. Now, I imagine right now some of you are thinking, but Erica, what about fill in name of highly disagreeable speech here? Or you're writing down, Erica, would you get rid of laws that regulate insert you know, speech that can be regulated here, like threats or obscenity? Now, these are good questions. When they come up, uh, when we talk about free speech, they are good for us to be talking about. They mean we're thinking about the balancing act between the benefits of free speech and other powerful social values. Now, to answer, no, I would not undo the carefully considered jurisprudence that has lifted some types of speech out from behind a First Amendment shield. I point, though, to the hard work that has been done and continues to be done to define those areas of speech and to balance them against important things like safety and decency, reputation, and trust. That's done by the courts, and it can be done by all of us as we weigh how to use our own powers of free speech. When we do so, just as the courts do, we must be aware of how regulation can extend far beyond its original parameters. Upholding a rule banning armbands today could be extended to all symbolic speech tomorrow. A rule punishing abusive speech may sweep up a handful of social media posts today, but could be extended to a wide range of dissenting posts tomorrow as abusive gets redefined or re-explained. It's a concept called the slippery slope, and we must guard against ill-considered steps that may be motivated by good intentions, but ultimately lead to overbroad censorship. Regulation of speech in the United States is at times necessary for society. Few things are absolute in this world, and I know that free speech is not one of them. But before we answer the question with how free should free speech be, with anything other than as much as the Constitution will allow, I ask, can the marketplace work? Yes, but we must be willing to listen, including to those with whom we do not agree. That might start small. I've had some spirited conversations with my colleague Pete Tucker, a professor of computer science, about the merits of Macs versus PCs. You see, I am a dedicated Mac user, and Pete is wrong. I mean, a PC user. <laughs> I've enjoyed our conversations. I don't think either of us had changed our minds, but the discussion is worthwhile. And I've had debates with treasured colleagues, including one person on this panel, <coughs> Will Kynes, <coughs> about the merits or lack thereof of the Oxford comma. <laughs> now, as a person with three journalism degrees who dreams an associated press style, I do not see high degree of value in that unnecessary piece of punctuation. Other colleagues in other departments disagree. And before you forward me the story about the lawsuit about the missing comma, I've read it. <laughs> to my main point, it may be a big leap to go from tech and grammar to big issues like gun rights or immigration, but it's a start. It's practice. We can do this. Can civility be restored? Yes, but it is a learned trait, not an automatic one. We must model the rights and responsibilities of free speech as both speakers and audiences, and we must demand better of those who would lead those discussions astray. Can we do this with education over regulation? Yes, but we must want to make that happen. And in doing so, we will retain a cherished aspect of our identity as a nation and as a democracy. Let's speak. Let's hear. Let's move forward together. Let me close tonight by returning back to Des Moines, Iowa, with an often unshared element of the story of Mary Beth and John Tinker. You see, they weren't the only Tinker children they had a younger sister. She was in elementary school at the time, and she too wore an armband to school that day, but her teacher didn't make her remove it. Now, when this little girl went out in the playground, some of the other kids started making fun of her, and a teacher came over, and instead of just telling those kids to stop, she told them why. She talked about what it meant to believe and how good it was that we lived in a country where this child could share her beliefs with her colleagues. That teacher is part of the solution. And probably the best part of the story, that little girl's name, was Hope. Thank you.
I want to thank Beck for the invitation to participate in tonight's conversation, and many thanks to Erica for her thought-provoking paper. I'd like to respond from, to her paper from the angle of political socialization, which is the process by which we acquire our political views, including our perspective on free speech and how free it should be. There are several agents of political socialization. I'd like to focus on two tonight. First, experiences that we live through, an experience that can be traveling, which I will focus on, or living through national events, such as 9-11, or personal events, such as losing one's job. The second agent of socialization I'm going to focus on are personal characteristics, demographics, such as gender, race, sexual identity, gender identity, social class. My view of how free speech should be was deeply affected in 1989 by a trip to China. In 1989, pro-democracy activists occupied Beijing's Tiananmen Square. On June 4, our tour group flew from Guangzhou to Beijing, where our Chinese and very sad tour guide told us that in the early hours of that morning, troops had entered the square and killed protesters, many of them students. The official death toll has never been released. That evening, a friend and I walked up and down the street looking at soldiers and personnel carriers. A Chinese student said to a group of us, when you return to your countries, tell them that China lost some of our best students today. The next day, again on the street, a student asked me if I spoke English and began telling me about the students' demands, among them free speech. When I returned to the States, I learned that while I had been away, the Supreme Court had handed down its decision in Texas v. Johnson, ruling 5-4 that a Texas law which prohibited the desecration of venerated objects, including the American flag, was unconstitutional. Gregory Lee Johnson, a member of the Revolutionary Communist Youth Brigade on the edges, had participated in a demonstration at the 84 Republican Con Convention in Dallas, where he had burnt an American flag. Writing for the majority, which included Justice Scalia, Justice William Brennan said this, if there is a bedrock principle underlying the First Amendment, it is that government may not prohibit the expression of an idea simply because society finds the idea itself offensive or disagreeable. The way to preserve the flag's special role is not to punish those who feel differently. It is to persuade them that they are wrong. The contrast between the lethal crackdown in Tiananmen Square and the court's flag-burning decision in 89 was stark and dramatic. The court's decision was controversial. My reaction was that I thought the court had gotten it right. Had I not been in Beijing, would I have viewed the court's decision the way I did? I think so. But that conversation on a Beijing street had solidified my perspective my continuing socialization about free speech. To become a naturalized citizen in the United States, a person has to answer correctly six questions out of 10 on the civics part of the naturalization test. One of the possible questions is this, what is one right or freedom from the First Amendment? Just so you know, speech, religion, assembly, press, and the right to petition the government. Native-born and naturalized citizens alike, as well as immigrants to this country, are in a way confirmed in the Church of the First Amendment. That said, freedom of speech is a right that we like in a theoretical sense, not always in practice. Why then, why that? is can be in part explained by who we are, our personal demographics that shape our views of how free speech should be. The naturalized citizen or the immigrant or the refugee who has fled a totalitarian regime 
may cherish free speech, whereas I, born here, might take it for granted. If we have been accustomed to being in the majority because of religion or race or gender or sexual orientation, we may not understand others' exercise of this right who are not in the majority. If we are different that's in ways that set us apart on the margins, then we cling to this right. Timothy Garton Ash, professor of European studies at, at Oxford, has written the book, Free Speech, 10 Principles for a Connected World. He quotes the 1963 song by jazz musician Billy Taylor. I wish I knew how it would feel to be free. And the wonderful version by jazz singer Nina Simone. And it goes like this. I wish I knew how it would feel to be free. I wish I could break all the chains holding me. I wish I could say all the things that I should say. Say them loud, say them clear. The song ends this way. I wish you could know what it means to be me. Ash writes that these last two lines, quote, are the most elemental argument for free speech because to be fully ourselves, I must be in communication with others. Silencing crushes souls, not just the soul of the person silenced, but it diminishes the soul of the silencer. Civil rights activist Fannie Lou Hamer, in a speech at the University of Wisconsin in 71, said, until I am free, you are not free either. Free speech ties us to each other. We may not like it. We may sigh a lot. We may be hurt. We may be angry. But as Erica has said, the work lies in educating, not regulating. And educating requires that we know each other through speech. And lots of it. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you, President Taylor, for convening this series. These are important questions of our day, and I'm grateful that we have the chance to discuss them. Thank you to my colleague and dear friend, Professor Erica Salkin, for your thoughtful remarks, and to my panelists for their meaningful contributions. There are three things on my mind this evening. First, the expression, educate, not regulate, is both catchy and wise. Rather than asking President Taylor and the faculty to protect them from strange or new ideas, I hope Whitworth students will wade into unknown waters and attend presentations by speakers with whom they would disagree. A few years ago, I attended a campus lecture by a Palestinian activist who unsurprisingly was critical of both the Israeli and American governments. We've had many such presentations like that on the campus across my 30 years here. Our parent denomination, the Presbyterian Church USA, is active in its critical evaluation of Israel's policies, and that represents some left-of-center thinking. But what about some right-of-center thinking? Well, last fall, our chapter of the Young Americans for Freedom brought Norm Bedeen, an Israeli photojournalist, to campus. He told his story of the relentless rocket attacks by Palestinian terrorists in his hometown. I hope that our students in our community would attend both such events, to be intentional about hearing speakers and ideas that differ from your own, to listen to both or all sides, those who are critical of Israel, those who would support Israel. That's important to listen to all those perspectives. I appreciate the invocation of Alexander Meklajan and his perspective on the right of the audience to hear a range of ideas. The premise, of course, is that these multiple viewpoints must be able to speak. They must be free to speak and be welcome, even when they make us uncomfortable. Second, the illustration of speech rulings crafted on the edges, as in the wild, wild west, rings true. It is on the frontier of expression that boundaries are drawn, laws are made, and hard conversations occur. 
Now, I don't know if anyone really laments over dueling economists talking about whether today's drop in the stock market is significant or not, or two musicians arguing strenuously whether the eighth note or the quarter note is the right fit for this particular measure. But many more will become concerned when protesters with less popular views or even scary views want to march and sing and protest with signs and burn flags, as Professor Lee indicated. It's the challenge to our conventions and the contemplation of the full meaning of free expression that we learn more about when we think on these things. So in the context of that wild, wild west, we must think deliberately about the range of allowed, regulated, or even forbidden ideas. But third this evening, let me say this, that not all attempts to regulate speech come from the wild west. Some come from right here in Dodge, in River City, or maybe even in the Loop. Christina Hoff Summers is a scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, a conservative think tank. This former professor offers several thoughtful viewpoints, including a critique of some ideas held about feminist thought. When the Federalist Society at Lewis and Clark College's School of Law invited her to speak on their campus last month, several different student groups showed up to shout her down to use the heckler's veto and preclude her from sharing her ideas. They hindered her ability to speak in a peaceful public speaking setting and denied their peers the opportunity to hear and assess her ideas for themselves. The Young Americans for Freedom at Suffolk University in Boston also invited her to speak on their campus this semester. But they were told by the assistant dean of students that their advertisements, quote, triggered and offended students, unquote, and those advertisements would have to come down. When Yaff asked which guideline had been violated, the Student Life Office said, those policies are not published yet. What a travesty. How unfair for lines to be drawn in an arbitrary fashion, not on the frontier of the Wild West, but right here in the middle of the academy. No doubt those lines were being drawn to preclude students from a view that some administrators or some faculty or some mob of students did not want others to hear. That reminds me of the title of journalist Nat Hintoff's book, Free Speech for Me, But Not for Thee. My hope and belief is that Whitworth will be a place where we can hear a range of voices on the issues of the day, not just those who favor the status quo or the politics of the Presbyterian Church. Let us not become a safe space where Republicans do not have to weather democratic critiques of their policies, where utilitarians are spared a Kantian analysis of their ethical conduct, where determinists can stop presentations by, subscribing, uh, by those subscribing to free will, and those who think Star Wars rules need to listen to Captain Kirk in the ways of the Federation. My hope is that the national press never comes to our campus to cover a heckler's veto, as it has at Lewis and Clark, at Washington State University, where the university was telling students to go and shout down a speaker years ago. My hope is that speech remains free here for students on the right, students on the left, and those smack dab in the middle. I hope these expressions will employ some of the thoughtful means of critical thinking and critical communication using principles that my colleague, Professor Nate King, outlined in his February presentation to this assembly. So how free should free speech be? On college campuses in general, and this one in particular, it should be broad. We ought to have the freedom, the courage, the intellectual curiosity to hear and assess a range of viewpoints in our search for truth. Let us not be fearful in that endeavor. Thank you. My thanks to President Taylor and Professor King and to Professor Salkin for her compelling argument that our, our right to expression free of regulation comes with a responsibility to engage others with civility. She provided valuable guidance for restoring and even raising the standard of that civility. In response, I'd like to take us a bit farther back into the history of our national experiment to the thought and practice of the 17th century Baptist theologian and founder of the colony of Rhode Island, 
Roger Williams, who would warn us against getting too excited in making Salkin's free speech responsibilities into requirements, even demands, for participation in civil discourse. Williams provides a robust understanding of free speech that Oxford philosophy professor Teresa Bejan in her book, Mere Civility, Disagreement, and the Limits of Toleration, has recently argued, provides precisely what our country needs today. Williams, Bejan argues, created the most tolerant and inclusive society the world had ever seen, welcoming people of all faiths into his colony. In this tolerant community, Williams lowered the standard for civil discourse as far as he feasibly could, advocating for mere civility, which is the minimal, often grudging conformity to social norms of respectful behavior just needed to keep a conversation going. To explain this counterintuitive move, Bejan compares Williams to his contemporaries. Building on her analysis, as I see it, these 17th century thinkers were wrestling with a trilemma, a tension between three apparently irreconcilable ideas. The first is difference. The many types of diversity, cultural, religious, ideological, that may contribute to a community. The second is disagreement. The, confl the conflicting views about foundational issues that inevitably emerge as a result of that difference. And the third item in this trilemma is discourse, the ability to communicate across those differences. It's easy to affirm two of these beliefs concurrently, just like it's a simple thing to hold two ice cream cones at once. But adding the third threatens to make a mess of your whole understanding of free speech. The simplest solution to this trilemma is to remove difference from the equation. Just kick out anyone who expresses a view that challenges the settled beliefs of the community. Problem solved. This is what Williams himself experienced when he was exiled from the Massachusetts Bay Colony by its governor, John Cotton, who was a proponent of religious persecution. However, aside from the ethical questions that it raises, this civil exclusion became infeasibly difficult amidst the proliferation of diverse religious beliefs in the post-Reformation and increasingly global world. Further, remove difference and the risk of exclusion will stifle both disagreement and discourse. Thomas Hobbes, therefore, suggested a different tack, civil silence. Recognizing that inevitable difference would make significant disagreement unavoidable, he proposed that discourse be dropped from the trilemma. The mere act of disagreement is offensive, Hobbes observed. Whatever one might feel inwardly, the outward expression, the act of disagreement, even in something as microscopic as a facial expression or a gesture, was to be avoided in Hobbes' view. In his view, a community could exist peacefully with difference and disagreement if there was no contentious discourse. However, this will minimize offense, but it will also raise questions about whether the unexpressed difference and disagreement are authentic and whether their toleration is actually sincere. John Locke, therefore, argued that maintaining external silence when one disagreed within was hypocrisy. He proposed instead that members of the community per pursue sincere respect for others' views. A member of the tolerant society he envisioned must give up his implacable enmities, setting aside his fiery zeal for his own sect, and recognize that all other views were in fact as several paths that are in the same road, leading in the same direction. As attractive as Locke's aspirational ideal of civil charity may be, enforcing it in the real world makes the perfect the enemy of the good. When those with power in the community use Locke's lofty standard to silence those that they deem insufficiently respectful, they turn civility from a shield into a sword, 
to put an end to disagreement rather than enable it. Our biased judgment on the type of discourse we will tolerate easily becomes a proxy for the type of difference we will tolerate. Locke himself, in his letter concerning toleration, ended up arguing against the toleration of Catholics, atheists, Muslims, and those he deemed intolerant. Dispelling disagreement will de facto exclude those who sincerely hold a different view or silence them. As we've seen, removing one of the elements from the civil discourse trilemma may appear to provide a solution, but in every case fails even to sustain the remaining two. Williams realized that the only way to tame this trilemma was to grab the mutant bull by all three of its horns. He would heartily agree with Dr. Salkin's defense of free speech as a means of pursuing truth in the marketplace of ideas. The ultimate truth for him, though, was the Christian gospel, which he believed must be embraced with a free conscience if it was to be embraced at all. That meant that others must be free to have and advocate freely, even disagreeably, for their own understandings of ultimate truth. This was why he opened Rhode Island to those of all faiths, not because, like Locke, he thought that they were following several paths on the same road, but because he thought they weren't, and yet he wanted to have the opportunity to convince them to change course. He wrote, because briars, thorns, and thistles may not be in the garden of the church, Therefore, they must be all plucked up out of the wilderness. Whereas he that is a briar, that is a Jew, a Turk, a pagan, an anti-Christian today, may be, when the word of the Lord runs freely, a member of Jesus Christ tomorrow. As Bajon writes, Williams was pretty sure they were all going to hell, and he told them so. Still, he thought one must go out of the world entirely, to avoid keeping company with such idolaters. More than that, he hoped to invite these idolaters into the church. This may offend modern sensibilities. Rousseau famously observed, it's impossible to live at peace with those we regard as damned. Williams, however, believed it was impossible to pursue truth with a free conscience unless we do live with those we regard as damned and can tell them so and that the peace that Rousseau sought would be a false one, built on excluding hypocrisy and silencing. Rousseau proves William's point three sentences later when he proclaims, whoever dares to say outside the church is no salvation ought to be driven from the state. Having experienced that exclusion himself, Williams was unwilling to pursue that type of counterfeit peace. Williams had himself been an oppressed minority, and yet for that very reason, he proposed a model that endorsed rather than minimized disagreement. However, he knew that a complete loss of civility would stifle discourse. He could present his message, but if he was shouted down, no one would hear it. Precisely because he was committed to civil discourse, to persuading others to his view, he set the bar for participating in that discourse as low as he feasibly could. In contrast, to his contemporaries, and many today, who raised it to soaring heights to enforce respect and avoid offense. If cotton restricts where we can be, Hobbes restricts what we can say, and Locke restricts what we can feel or even think, then Williams restricts what we can expect in civil discourse. The truth is, whether religious or secular, we're all evangelists, for the beliefs that we hold most dear. When encountering those who differ from us, Bejan writes, everyone is a little imperial, and not simply because everyone is his own exemplar of right reason, but his own exemplar of civility as well. Channeling Williams, she claims, the true test of tolerance is whether we allow others to speak freely, and more importantly, to win converts to their cause. Whitworth aims to be an inclusive community similar to Williams's Rhode Island, welcoming students from any faith or none at all. But like Williams himself, as a Christian university, we are also committed to our mission to honor God, follow Christ, and serve humanity. As we think about how free speech can be on our campus or in this nation, the paradigmatic examples of Cotton's civil exclusion, Hobbes's civil silence, Locke's 
civil charity and Williams's mere civility will enable us to evaluate our standards, which will contribute best to the health of this community. Perhaps stretching the edges of the freedom of speech with Williams will better protect its center. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, panelists, not only for your insightful comments, but for leaving us a healthy 30 minutes to talk amongst ourselves about some of the ideas you presented. Um, Nate and Ruth are going to be circulating around the chapel to collect your questions. And so I know they're eager to collect those and we'll be going through those and have a chance to ask some of those questions in just a moment. While they're doing that, I want to turn to Dr. Salkin and um, I noticed that the panel was largely in agreement with many of your thoughts and theses. They were well behaved tonight, which is a little unexpected, frankly. Um, but I, I would give you the opportunity, Erica, to reflect on any of the things you heard tonight um, and comment on them. Well, thank you. Uh, one thing that I found interesting and, and um, I enjoyed hearing from all three of you was a reflection of uh, self-realization as a benefit of free speech. Uh, Thomas Emerson, a, a professor who in 1970 wrote A System of Free Expression, which he considered a short treatise on free speech in the United States that ran over a thousand pages. I'd hate to see what was long in Mr. Emerson's uh, opinion said that one of the key reasons why free speech was so essential, especially in a democracy, was the opportunity for self-realization. To understand who you are, you need to be able to voice that. And I heard that in, uh, in one way or another from all three, and I'd actually uh, be very intrigued to hear from my colleagues up here um, what their, their takeaways, if they, um, how they see that kind of playing out perhaps in the college or the university setting at a time in life when many people are trying to figure out who they are, uh, what they believe, what they stand for, and the role that free speech might play in that, um, in that journey. One of the pieces that I have thought about um, in, the, in the years that I've been teaching is how much I have learned from my colleagues. Um, and so when we think about free speech on campus, I, I would not be who I am but for the interaction um, with colleagues and listening to them, not always agreeing with them, but being pushed and um, unsettled uh, in some ways and having to think more deeply. Uh, so in that regard, uh, I'm, I'm very grateful for a place which in many ways is open to that kind of discourse. There is an article, very briefly, um, the title of which is Where, Does Speech, Where Free Speech Goes to Die, uh, and it's about Christian colleges. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's by Katha Pollitt, who hasn't been to many Christian colleges, uh, in my view. Uh, and uh, it's unfortunate that there's that view out there. That said, are Christian colleges completely free? No. And in some ways, they're very troubling, troubling not free. So it's a question of, of, of balance in some ways. But self-realization has come in part from, for me, uh, being at places which have promoted free speech. We talk about the education of mind and heart. And it would just be a shame if in class you students were thinking about things and determining what it is that you believe and starting to find your own voice, but then you couldn't exercise that voice if you were shut down either by peers or by faculty staff. Uh, it just seems so connected together to me. There's a term in the last decade, uh, the term voice, to help people find their voice, to speak their voice, and I think that occurs best in an atmosphere where you're free to have those exchange of ideas with people. and. So there's just a great connection between personal development and the right to express yourself and to hear what others are thinking about. Yeah, I mean, there's not too much that I could add to my colleagues. Uh, I think one thing that really struck me with engaging with Williams' ideas is the emphasis that he put on the importance of the freedom of conscience. And anything that would restrict that freedom of conscience 
uh, restricts that pursuit of self-realization, the pursuit of ultimate truth. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's, I think, something that instinctively at college campuses people seem to realize, and probably the reason we're in such agreement here as faculty is the importance of being able to engage with a wide range of ideas so that you can choose what is true and right. And Williams was a good Baptist, wasn't he? He sure was. Amen. Mike, yes. <laughs> I, think, I think Williams would be turning in his grave um, in Rhode Island at his um, fabled Brown University and some of the things that are going on there. OK, we've got our questions here, a couple of them. If the solution is to train people to listen, how do you train people to want to listen, especially when they consider their opponents morally or intellectually uh, reprehensible? Part of it is um, creating the space for those voices to occur um, with the hope that uh, knowing that I have the space to express my views and to um, be heard and be heard by open, if not necessarily completely receptive ears, that there becomes then an opportunity for reciprocity. Um, and that's something that has to, it takes time. It takes time for us to believe that, okay, I have been heard and now maybe there's the chance for me to hear others. Uh, but when we get into that idea of um, the freedom that I have enjoyed by being able to speak, the other half of that is the freedom to listen. Uh, if we understand that ability to hear the, the range of ideas, even if it's people that we don't necessarily agree with, and perhaps it's people who we know are going to be saying things that we aren't particularly excited to hear, uh, but understanding that it is, to, it is also a freedom to be able to hear that, to embrace that as a right and a responsibility, that I think starts getting us in the direction of um, retraining our ears to hear. I went to college thinking that all Christians would vote a particular way, and I met lots of other smart Christians who, who didn't see it that way, and they voted in a whole variety of ways. And it's easy to have a first reaction of, what, that's stupid, they're stupid, why well, listen to stupid people? So it requires an initial suspension to jump to that conclusion, and then, then really listen to what other people are saying. Sometimes people will say things that are not very well founded, but oftentimes they're saying something that has merit to it. So if we could help each other to wait before jumping, that would be really useful. How do openness to all ideas and the right to peaceful protest coexist at Whitworth? If we agree that shouting down a speaker is not how we want to respond, what are other ways that we should express dissent? Uh, debate. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, he would, he would say that. Um, I, I almost said something about this in the presentation, but I'll talk about it here. Uh, last year, on the campus of Washington State University, a group of college Republicans built a wall to, to mimic the proposed wall by President Trump on the American-Mexican border. And there were a number of people who were really upset by that, a number of people who wanted to shut down the gathering, to not allow them to do that, to forbid them to meet, all these other kinds of things. And it seemed like some wiser heads prevailed. And while you're building your wall over here, a group of us are going to go over here and hear these speeches or, or sing these songs. And what a great opportunity for people who were trying to decide which one to go to or to go to both. Uh, it seems like if we will engage the other, then we recognize that there is this right to protest, but to do it in a way that it, it's not the heckler veto, but yet still shows a contrasting view and presents another way of thinking about it. I don't know. I, I looked up the student handbook, um, which was an interesting <laughs> read. Um, <laughs> and I don't know. I, I, I read page 22. Um, which is about one of the big three, uh, violent and destructive behavior, uh, which includes hate speech. And we could have a whole another panel, could we not, just on that one, one subject. And it's interesting to see um, how, how hate speech is defined uh, in the student handbook and how it's, it's 
it's treated. Um, and that's, that's an, you know, yet another example of the balancing that's required, you know, as you were saying at WSU, how do we, and this I think is a very important distinction, we are a private community. Um, and that's very, very important to distinguish between that and the First Amendment and, and what the state can do. And so Whitworth can set out certain parameters which might become more problematic um, in different kinds of situations. Um, and it's interesting to see how we try, and I'll just read you one line. Um, let me just read you one line. As a community of educated individuals, we believe we can find ways to communicate and disagree with one another without using words that are hateful or that incite violent acts. Um, and, and, that, and that goes to norms, not laws. And, and I think for me, as a political scientist at this moment, what is most distressing is the slippage in norms. Um, not so much laws, trollery, if you will. Um, and that's where I, I become very concerned about how do we seek balance in, a me in a, an immediate ecosystem which is so different than it used to be. Let me follow up with that, um, with, with your ideas there, Kathy. Um, I think that even those that uh, think very liberally about um, free speech and the protection of the First Amendment um, would say that there's a difference between protecting speech and behavior. Um, that indeed there are many, many forms of, it, it, to use the words of the student handbook, violent behavior that we would want to prohibit. One of the challenges to free speech uh, of late is the um, equating of words and violence. This idea that words, particularly those that undercut one's identity or self-worth or uh, character, can actually be tools of violence. Is that a stretch? And uh, if it's not, what are ways that we can um, uh, uh, convince those that participate in the public square that words, in fact, don't equal violence? But if it is, you know, if it is true, then doesn't that make our protection of free speech even more difficult? Yeah, I, I think I think that's tremendously difficult. Um, and the and the book that I mentioned by Ash. Um, 10 Principles for a Connected World, uh, goes into a, dis in, in his chapter on diversity, uh, suggests, and I'm gonna put this out there and then I'm gonna probably reel it in, um, is that in order to protect free speech, we all need to have thicker skins. Now at the moment that I say that, I'm also very, very conscious <laughs> of how hurtful language can be. And I don't have the balance in my own mind of what that looks like exactly. And so when groups of people who have been marginalized for years and decades um, are called hateful, hateful use, you know, names, how, that's where norms we've, we've lost our norms. I mean, I, I think about my, the socialization by the way, of our, those who raised us. You know, my mother said to me, that's not nice to say. That is so basic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, even now, even now, <laughs> I can hear her. I, I, I will say something, I'll think, that's not nice, you know? Um, and that's where I think, how do we, how do we protect people who've been marginalized and protect speech. I, I, don't want I don't want physical violence to be trivialized. Um, but I also don't want emotional trauma to be ignored. Um, and, and that's what, what's so hard, I think. Uh, so Bejan, when she's reflecting on Williams and his view of a, a mere civility, she says, uh, uh, it shifts much of the burden of civil conversation from the speaker to the listener, requiring the latter to cultivate, among other things, insensitivity to others' opinions and an identity separate from that immersed in debate. And when I was reading her work, I, I got caught up on that too, Kathy, to think that 
we're putting the burden on those who have are already carrying quite a heavy burden. Uh, yeah, so it, it's a real challenge. Uh, and then the one thing Williams is coming from the experience of having been kicked out of his home in Massachusetts and the fact that it's that experience that leads him to want to lower the bar of civility because he's seen how having a high bar for civility, and this seemed like a point that you were making in your response, can actually be used uh, to attack those who have less power in a community. Uh, it seems like there's, there's a bit of weighing of goods there on either side, but it's a, it's a real challenge. And we absolutely have to be careful of the slippery slope. One of the justifications in Des Moines uh, for creating a rule that said you can't wear a black armband to school was there are kids out there who have family members who are serving in Vietnam. Uh, there are kids out there who have lost loved ones, and this will hurt them. And so therefore, you should not engage in what the court later called an act of classic political speech of wearing a black armband. Imagine now, you know, the, could we imagine the, the fear that wearing an armband would completely disrupt a school? That was the norm in the 1960s. Our norms today are different. Uh, but that's where this becomes so hard because as Kathy and Will both said, this is speech that, that causes harm. You know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Lying, 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 lie, lie, right? <laughs> we know that words can hurt, and we know that they can cause immense pain. How do we, find, how do we walk that, that line between preventing the pain but still protecting speech? And that is probably the, I'd say, one of the biggest challenges for free speech in the modern era. Well, I, I, I would quickly add, it's it really important, to me, it's important who is telling me to have a thicker skin? <laughs> um, and, and so, are the, you know, as the person who's, who's had privilege forever telling me to have th a thicker skin, um, that the speaker is important in that, in that moment. And I think that's part of the equation, too. Here's another question from our audience. Protecting and promoting the free marketplace of ideas assumes that free discourse will help truth to overcome falsehood. If that's true, how do we explain the prevailing rhetoric out of the White House today? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> Me neither. I have a name. <laughs> I don't think the story is over yet. I mean, We've been introduced to lots of new terms in the last two years in political discourse. And, and like yet, slime ball? Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, new names for some countries in Africa and Central America that I didn't know about till, till recently. But yet there are great news organizations who are reporting those truths. There are great advocacy groups who are challenging and presenting counter narratives to what the White House is saying about that. So there's a struggle going on, I think, absolutely. Absolutely there is. There's lots of documented false statements being made by this government. That's not a partisan statement, that's a factual statement, check it. But I think the virtue of the marketplace of ideas here is that we have lots of voices who are serving then to say, that's not the case, here's evidence. Here's what you said in a speech five years ago. Now reconcile this. So truth is fighting back. So that gives me hope and credence in the marketplace. I think, I, I think I, while I agree with that metaphor to a certain degree, I, I also think that one, of, one can critique classical liberalism as assuming kind of that we're all the same individuals. And so that we enter the marketplace with the same knowledge um, with the same voices being amplified in the same way. And so the, f the free marketplace assumes a certain individual which isn't always present um, and, and isn't always heard. And so that metaphor, I, I, I like it. It has limits uh, to describing reality. Um, um, so, I mean, having gone to law school and having sat through two semesters of contract law, you recognize that 
people don't enter the marketplace um, in the same way and need to be protected uh, from unequal relationships. And so the free marketplace of ideas, while very attractive, has, has its limits, I think, as a metaphor. So. To use economic jargon, jargon, perhaps there's market failures yes, that we should be absolutely. looking yeah. for. Mm -hmm. um, so speaking of metaphors, Whitworth is fond of using them to describe <laughs> itself, uh, in part because we're a complex organization. We try to elevate simultaneously many goods. Uh, we try to live somewhat paradoxically into those commitments. Um, one of the metaphors that has been used most recently to try to describe our aspirational features, not to say that that is what we are, but at our best, we aspire to be what one of our colleagues who's here tonight um, describes as a bullseye organization. That is, as a campus that both embraces um, ideas and faith, um, conviction and curiosity, that we can be very firm at the center of what we do and what we believe, but not spend so much time, energy, and bandwidth patrolling the boundaries of the organization. That we can be both firm at the center and have soft edges. I think that that metaphor, um, like all metaphor, break, breaks down at some points, but I think it does describe Whitworth's ethos. I think our are wanting to allow that free marketplace of ideas, despite the limitations of that term, onto our campus. But are there ideas or persons who would um, spout those ideas that would be so contrary to our understanding of who we are, our mission as a university, our identity as a Christian university, that we would not allow them on campus? And if so, who gets to decide that? I think some of the easy boogeymen and boogie women and people of boogie would be uh, those who would advocate violence. I think those who would advocate things that are illegal, uh, child pornography, and those would be really easy boundaries to go to, to make that kind of determination. I think who gets to decide, I think at some other institutions, I think it would be the person sitting in your office. And <laughs> what I appreciate about you is I think that you would seek collective wisdom from advisors and community leaders before making that kind of determination. So the answer to the second part, I, I think, is easy, or easier. Mm -hmm. I think that you would collect some consensus on making a determination. So Mike says it's like pornography. You'll, you'll, you'll see it, you'll know it when you see it. Potter Stewart. <laughs> That always is the million dollar question, right? How free should free speech be? Well, where does it stop? Uh, when we look at the history of the First Amendment, when we look at free speech decisions um, in the United States, it's always been a balancing act. And so we have to ask, well, what's competing? Uh, and a lot of those end up being sort of this, not necessarily case by case, because they create precedents that carry forward, but we always look at what competes, and we recognize that there are things that compete in big situations and in small situations, and that's the process that I would expect to happen at Whitworth. What competes with the, the, the speech that this person wants to bring to our campus? What is it, is it safety? Um, is it decency? Is it trust? Um, and then how do we figure out how to balance two things that are so equally important? Um, this is a hard discussion. It is a difficult one. And, you know, if the next question is, okay, hypothetically, who would you bring forward? That would be a very tough um, situation to, to try and suss out. But it's acknowledging the balance. It's acknowledging that both things are important, but at some point we have to figure out which one carries a little more weight. So as teachers, each of you um, has responsibility over classroom environments that promote learning. What steps do you take, if any, to ensure that contrary or unpopular views have equal opportunities to be heard in your classroom? I put people on the spot. <laughs> I have people get into groups and articulate an assigned viewpoint that might be their own viewpoint or there might be another viewpoint trying to foster a space where it's okay for other viewpoints, distinct viewpoints, to be heard. So sometimes that role taking and role assignment can be a nice gateway for people to do that. 
Um, and then they hopefully will become more comfortable in articulating, I actually do have a contrarian view to what the other majority of students have been saying in the class. I think it comes from the selection of readings that you, that you try to incorporate, um, not always successfully, but um, attempting to say, all right, on the one hand, on the other hand. Um, so, an, you know, a concrete example would be um, students in my intro class will be reading uh, a selection by Justice Antonin Scalia on how the Constitution should be interpreted, and they'll be reading a selection from Justice Stephen Breyer, mm. uh, who represent opposite, opposite, not well, opposite views of constitutional interpretation. So, I think readings are are an important part of that. Yeah, I think the value of that, uh, Kathy, it's a great idea. Is it just let students know these ideas are worth engaging with. And another thing that you can do just in a classroom discussion is, we all I'm sure do this, play devil's advocate when the devil needs to have a voice in the room. <laughs> you know, uh, So uh, just so that we students know how to respond to views that they disagree with, if none of your students are willing to step up and um, betray a contrasting view. And that can just give students a little more uh, comfort with actually disagreeing, even if you have to force them to disagree with you, uh, that sets that, that tone. I think in classes, sometimes we have to teach people how to do that disagreement. Mm. And I appreciate the structures in, in your presentation that in some classes, I found students who were much more comfortable to disagree without being disagreeable, and then others who are drawn much more to the, well, it would be better if we just didn't disagree, and, and you don't get to talk about ideas. So there is some modeling of that to help encourage people how to do that. And developing those questions that don't have easy answers, mm -hmm. uh, ones that can be fairly argued from multiple perspectives, making sure that students know that you can argue this, and then you know, walking the walk. Mm -hmm. So if you put a question out there and say, you guys can answer this in any way as long as you can back it up with evidence, if you can support it, then you're going to get the points. And as they start to see, wow, I don't have to agree with her as long as I can come up with a support, you know, I can support my answer and say, here's why I believe this to be true, or here's why I think this would turn out this way. And, well, I didn't get hurt. You know, I got all my points. I got a good grade. I can continue to disagree as long as I can support it, as long as I can make the valid argument. Um, creating the questions that allow for multiple perspectives and then, you know, really supporting the idea of, yes, you can disagree. And do so, you know, and still be incredibly successful in this class. Last year, our student government here uh, did a constituent survey in which many, many students, the vast majority, expressed some level of discomfort, maybe even fear, um, at the extreme of voicing either unpopular um, or um, uh, minority opinions on campus. All of you have been at Whitworth long enough, and certainly, um, Mike and Kathy, you've, you've certainly seen um, a trajectory of campus discourse over time. What changes have you seen in your students over the past several years, how, however long you want to look back, in terms of their willingness to enter into these difficult conversations, express, use their freedom of expression and liberty of conscience to express minority or different opinions that maybe go against the the popular notion of things. Have you noticed any differences in students' abilities or willingness to do that over time? Um, I, 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 sometimes, yes. Okay, the quick answer would be that. I, I struggle sometimes with not knowing what's going on. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Sort of a, a, if you will, a political apathy. <laughs> Um, and not by certain, you know, typical student in, in political science, oftentimes, you know, there's obvious reasons is there because they're interested. But I think sometimes, I always think I would like to be teaching these students um, 10 years from now uh, when they will have had more experiences in life. Um, and what will that bring then to the discussion uh, in, in some ways? Um, in terms, I think that I think the 2016 election, there is some t timidity in light of the election, uh, and so trying to kind of flesh that out is is difficult at times. Um, so I think that would be my response. And I haven't been here long enough to talk about changes, but I think because we're a community that consists of a good bit of difference on religious views. 
I've seen a lot of the kind of Hobbesian civil silence. We just don't talk about certain things because we know they'll be contentious. Or the Lockean civil charity. Well, we just assume that we all agree and we're not going to be willing to say that someone is wrong on something. We'll just talk about the parts we agree about. That happens here. And it seems like it's natural. I mean, Hobbes and Locke were smart guys, and they advocated for those responses. Uh, so it, it happens here. But I wonder if we could do more of the courageous conversations. I mean, that seems like more of the mere civility approach to some of these differences, that the way you make progress is through disagreeing with one another. It helps you find truth. I came here from the University of Wisconsin, which is often called the Berkeley of the Midwest. <laughs> Students there protested everything. <laughs> um, whether it was worth protesting or not, because everybody knows gluten is a terrible, terrible thing and we should eradicate it, so let's make some signs. <laughs> Coming to Whitworth, uh, it is a it has been a different mentality, but I do still see the spark there. And one thing that I've seen in the wake of uh, what happened in Parkland, Florida, is the sense that there is a voice to be shared and change that can be made. Um, I have a feeling back if you asked us this question a year from now, we might be saying something's changing. There's something in the air. Um, and I think that's going to ripple through as um, younger people uh, kind of more firmly embrace their role in the national discourse and see that uh, people will listen uh, and that uh, careful conversations uh, that bring forward good ideas and that engage in good discourse may be hard, uh, but are worthwhile. Uh, I'm optimistic. I think we're turning a corner. Well, on that, would you all please thank, uh, join me in thanking them for their wonderful comments. Thank you. Well, done. well, this evening, as I said, concludes this year's Colloquy series. I hope that you have found the series to be helpful to you as you think about the role that civil dialogue plays not only in your own personal relationships, but in the communities you care about. These talks and the subsequent monograph of collected essays that will be published later this summer, I hope will serve the Whitworth community for many years to come, particularly as Whitworth aims to create and to sustain a community that is known not only for its commitment to chase difficult and controversial issues, but also for how it goes about this important work, all of which is meant to honor God, follow Christ, and serve humanity. So God bless you all. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you.